is your host, Gary Cachulio. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Everything Imaginable. I am your host, Gary Cacciolillo. And before we get started, I want to thank everybody for listening and also thank the contributors to my show, who are executive producers Candice Sanderson, author of The Reluctant Messenger, and Ms. Aida, psychic and author of Voodoo Justice Magic, binaural production engineer Damien Keller, author of Sounds Good, Sounds Great, monthly co-host Jared Murphy, author of It's Not Aliens, It's Worse, It's Us, and monthly co-host Kat Baldwin, author of The Forgiveness Workshop. If you are interested in contributing to the show, go to my website, everythingimaginable2020.com, and you'll find everything you need there. And now, without further ado, our guest for today is Candace Sanderson, author of The Reluctant Messenger, and thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for having me back on. Anytime, thanks. In the end of September, Hurricane Ian hit where I live in southwest Florida here in Naples. And it devastated some of the, my neighboring cities like Fort Myers Beach and Sanibel Island. Right. But I love it because you asked me to come on the show. And this is bringing a sense of normalcy back in my life. Because as of today, it's been 35 days since I have been home and to sleep in my own bed. Mm -hmm. the, um, the hurricane was like, was unbelievable. We had a storm surge. And every time we have a hurricane, I mean, Gary, I've lived here 30 years. And they always say, well, there might be a storm surge. We've never had it before. But the Gulf of Mexico just rushed all the way through my building. And it destroyed two floors. We in the lower floor is a garage, mm -hmm. and the cars that were not moved floated away. Some of them just stayed there and filled with sand. And then the first floor, which luckily no one lives on the first floor, it's all community stuff, you know, party room, office, exercise room. That's just like completely gone. And right now, because we have two, tw we have twin buildings. We have like 48 doors, exterior doors that need to be replaced, but it's been, it's been just this huge wake up call. Now for me, I evacuated, but I evacuated a half a mile inland to where my daughter lives. But Gary, what's so weird about this in the past, they've always said, oh, here's, you know, everyone should evacuate. Uh, here's some centers that are open. So, you know, there's a place to go, but they didn't expect the storm to hit us. They originally thought it would be hit, I don't know, closer to Tampa. Mm -hmm. So we just didn't have the notice like we usually do. It was mm -hmm. kind of not, it's a, it was a little unsettling. Absolutely. I, I can totally relate to what you're saying because when I went through my divorce and moving and all of that, it was the podcast that sort of helped keep me grounded and give me like, the, I don't know, some sense of normalcy. Because when everything's gone yeah. like that, you're just holding on to whatever you have left, you know? Yeah. Um, for you, um, you know, when, when I experience those type of things, I tend to lose touch with the spiritual things. You know, and, and, and I come back to this physical reality, back into survival mode, back into the lizard brain, you know, yeah. um, how is it for you and how has it been for you to stay connected to, you know, the more spiritual part of life? Well, it's, it's been interesting. When, when you say you're in survival mode, I have used that phrase, I don't know how many times, even in the last couple of days, because when the foundational beliefs, your whole foundation, your life is disrupted, then you got to go somewhere. And luckily for me, I had my angels and guides that helped me through this. Now, I've had people ask me whether I had a heads up. You know, did I know something was coming? Did spirit let me know? And I don't know. I, I, I can't really say that I had a heads up, <clears throat> excuse me, but 
a lot of times we've had evacuation notices in the past with hurricanes mm -hmm. and I didn't evacuate, but this time I did. So was that like a nudge from my guides? Maybe, I mean, I don't know, but since then, oh my gosh, um, I can feel my guides around me all the time. I mean, first of all, I was so lucky that my daughter lived so close and I, I stayed there with, you know, Cassie and her husband and the two grandkids, Shalane and Lorelai, they're, you know, ages six and 10. So they were great, but we lost electricity. We were without electricity for five days. Well, that's no big deal, but when you're used to it and you're in 90 degree weather and you're accustomed to your air conditioning, everything changes. We, I, of, of all the cell phones that we had, mine was the only one that could get power right. um, or that, you know, could get whatever. So people were using my phone. We had to charge it by going out to the car, which is okay. But we learned, we slipped into this pattern. When the sun went down, we went to bed. When, when the sun came up and, and we woke up, we had the windows open. And when the windows were open, you could hear the birds in the morning. You could also hear all the neighbors, not my daughter, but all the neighbors, their, um, you know, they had their generators going and it's like, uh, well, well, we didn't exactly have a generator, but it was nice to slip into this pattern of being part of nature. And I could have fought it, but it's like, no, there's nothing we can do. Just go with the tide, go with the flow. And what I learned, I learned, and I'm still learning, is to make the best of a situation at hand. But in order to do that, I had to find a different perspective. Um, once the roads were clear enough for us to go back to my condo, and that was several days, um, and a couple of days after that, I was able to retrieve my car, luckily from the upper garage. But one morning I had my car and I was gonna go over to my condo. Now my apartment itself was okay. But the building was such a, such a mess. And so I had to climb up all the steps to get to my apartment. But anyway, I was getting ready to go over. And this was after five days. So we had electricity. I checked my email. And I have a podcast, the Reluctant Messenger podcast. And Buzzsprout had sent me an, an email that said, your latest episode is live. Well, I upload those a month at a time. I had no idea what it was. Well, it was a show called Angels Looking Out Over You or Angels Watching Over You. And I thought, well, that's so appropriate. And it was like a sign I really needed. So then I asked for more. And I specifically said, I want a sign from my angels, from my guides telling me that everything's gonna be okay. Because once again, you're in survival mode. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm driving over and it's just like a seven minute ride and a, a van pulls in front of me. And as they pull it in front of me, I look at the side of it and it says, Charlie's Angels Plumbing. And I thought, there's my sign right there. And then when they turned and I saw the back of the van, their motto was, nothing stops an angel. And Gary, it just brought, it brought tears to my eyes because mm -hmm. I had specifically asked for a sign and I got it, but I can feel my guidance team around me. I am learning about resilience. I am doing things on my own that I never thought possible. Um, I have a storage unit that was 30 years of stuff that was under four feet of water for days. And we had to clean everything out. I mean, I, I have a bad back. I've had like seven or eight neck and back surgeries. So I have to be very careful about lifting and pulling. I did all of that by myself. And I, I never thought that I could. But I've learned I've got a skill set. And when it comes to that mode of being in a situation that you're not familiar with, 
and you don't think you can do it. I felt uplifted by my guidance team and I've done what I needed to do. So although I would have rather had lessons like the easy way, mm -hmm. <laughs> this was not the easy way. <laughs> but I mean, it shows that when you need help, help arrives. And, and when you ask for it, because that's important too. How do you do that? How do you ask for help from the spirit guides, guardian angels? How do you ask? Okay, you can use two words. Help me. I mean, it's <laughs> literally, I mean, really, Gary, it's literally that. Mm -hmm. it, it's asking. Um, quite often in, in my first book, well, in the second book was all about angels and connections. But in the first book, I, I have a chapter um, that talks about the angelic presence. And all they, they, they will come and they will help you but they really don't want to interfere with the life lessons that we have. So they really want us to ask for help. I asked for a sign and I got it. Two signs in a row about angels. But sometimes it is as simple as that. Just saying, I need some help. So, you know, if you pray, if you meditate, if you just step in silence and just say, I need some help. Please bring in some help for me. And then ask for a sign. Ask for them to show you something that you know that they're with you. And then pay attention. You know, is it a song on the radio? Is it is just, is it, I don't know, is it a feeling in your heart? Is there a dream that you have that's significant? I can remember once, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to a meditation and the, the guy who was doing the meditation said, now we're going to meet our guides. And so I want you to ask for a sign after you meet your guide that will tell you that this was true, that this is not something you're making up. And he said, I want you to ask for something specific. So one person in the group said, and, and you know, I live in Florida, no volcanoes, but he said, I want to see an active volcano. I want to see a volcano erupting. So that was the sign that he wanted. Mm -hmm. A few days after that, so he, he did the meditation. He, you know, meets his angels or guides and he doesn't know if it's true or not. A few days after that, he goes to his mailbox. And when he opens his mail, they, they accidentally put his neighbor's mail in his mailbox. His neighbor is a geologist. So there is this beautiful, magazine with a on the very front of it brilliant colors of an active volcano erupting and it's like wow there's your sign right there so hmm. ask for help but also ask for a sign that you know that it's true and then be aware again it might be a thought it might be someone calling you that you haven't heard from it might be something that comes through a dream, but there are ways that they will let you know that they're they're with you. Hmm. I, I've tried. I don't haven't gotten a name from my angel or anything like that, or or any physical type of description. Yeah. When I've tried this, I've been actually probably trying this now for about a month, month and a half, and one of the things that I have struggled with. Is humility asking for help? Is there any suggestions that you have for that? And is that a common thing? Oh, oh well, I am so independent, and well, I should say I try to be so independent, and I don't want to ask people for help. I want to take care of my business the way it needs to be taken care of. And I don't want to bother other people. And part of the lesson I learned during Hurricane Ian was when you're vulnerable, there are times that you do need help. And it's okay to step into that space where you know you can't do this on your own. And it's okay to ask for help. But when it comes to angels, I've had a lot of angels come in and they don't necessarily tell me their names, but nor do I ask for them. Mm 
-hmm. But sometimes you you want that connection. You want to have a name. Um, I worked with my granddaughters once and they want to know who their angels were. And as soon as they said that, I had a couple names that just came in and little just descriptions of them. One had red hair, the other was blonde. And it's like, those are their angels. What comes into me for you as soon as you said that is, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but it's like Joseph, but Joseph, it's Joseph, like Mm J-O-S-E-P-H-I-E-L. I'll look it up. There's probably one name that, but that's, that's the name that came to me when you were saying you don't know who your, your angel is, but our angelic team changes. We have angels that come in when we're born. There's a whole team of them. Some of them stay with us through our entire life. They're part of what's called a transition team. They, when we transition to being human, and then when we transition back to the non-physical, those same angels remain with us. But throughout our journey, we might need some specific help in another, another way, maybe with relationships, for mm-hmm. example. So we may have a new angel that comes in and helps us with that. But angels are always with us. And, and try to... What I try to do is to sit in silence, Mm -hmm. breathe in through my heart space, which means just imagining breath coming in through the heart. And that, that helps you step outside of the brain, the analytical brain. And as a psychologist, I lived with being, I analyzed everything. And now I've learned to bring that energy down to the heart. Because the messengers have told me that that heart is a portal to the other side. It's a portal to the non-physical. So by sitting in silence, breathing in and out through your heart, you're more likely to connect to this field where your angels reside. And then just pay attention to what happens. Do you feel a little different? Do you notice the breeze? that blows in your hair when you're walking. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of ways that they can send us signs. What is the difference between a guardian angel and a spirit guide? Well, I think they're, well, first of all, you know, I have no earthly idea. All I can Mm -hmm. tell you is what my experience is. And I have a guidance team and a lot of people come in. And I say people in air quotes, a lot of um, entities come in, uh, which also can kind of lead to my new book. I want to talk to you about it a little bit too, but the guidance team sometimes has angels. Mm-hmm. They're not always guardian angels. There are angels that guard you and protect you. That's one of the jobs that they do. But when I think of guardian angels, I think in terms of like um, there's there's Michael, who's an archangel. I think in terms of the archangels as right. really being the ultimate in the guardians. But there are so many of our angels that are here to protect and to guard us. But so they're part of guidance. They're so, And they're in spirit. So they're part of your spirit guides. But then you can have spirit guides that certainly are not from the angelic realm. Um, some may be cosmic beings, some may be religious icons from the past. I can remember years ago, I had a message from someone named Quan Yin. And Gary, I had never heard of Quan Yin. That was a, a new name for me. That's a Zen so, guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've know, read it, Quan Yin. <laughs> Well, see, that's what so that's what I love about spirit. They came to me during an early morning commute while I'm driving to work way back. It was August 28th, 2013, minding my own business, driving to work as a psychologist. And all of a sudden, I get these messages. 
Mm -hmm. And I got so many messages. But for example, one was from Kuan Yin. I had to look her up to see, who, first of all, to see if she really was someone. And it's like, oh my gosh, she really is. Yeah, I think she was so, like a female incarnation of sort of like Buddha. Well, yeah, she's she's like, um, like in the Catholic religion, you've got Mother Mary. Mm -hmm. Kuan Yin is kind of like Mother Mary's counterpart in the Buddhist religion, you know, you know, connected to Buddha. But I mean, she's just this compassionate one that anyone who studies those Eastern philosophies and religion know about her. But I was from the psychologist from Paducah, Kentucky, and <laughs> Kuan Yin was not on my radar. I mean, I barely knew who Buddha was. Mm -hmm. So that's why once I started getting all these messages, and I could verify at least some of the, the, the people or the, the, me the messengers that came to me, it made me realize whatever this is, or however I'm connecting to the spirit world, I'm truly connecting to a source that is, in, you know, for me, very legitimate for them to come to me and tell me who they are. And it's like, who? It, I mean, if, if I had known who Kuan Yin was, it wouldn't have been as significant because I would have thought I was making it up. Wow. That is incredible. When you get these messages, how do you get them? They, they come with like a little voice in the back of your head. Um, do you have visions? Do you go into a trance? Okay, I do not go into a trance. I, you know, I, I guess I'm a channeler. Other people have said that and they said, well, you're channeling information. So, okay, I can accept that. But I am alert when I receive that information um, for the first couple of years because I got my first message while I was driving to work. I got into this routine. I would get in my car, buckle my seatbelt, crank on the engine and I would hit record on my iPhone and the messages would just flow. Now I would hear them, but it's not like I would, it, um, I would hear the words, but not with my ears. Mm -hmm. They would come through my mind, but Gary, they were so specific. It was just like dictation. The messengers would tell me how to end a sentence you know, period, exclamation mark. They would tell me new paragraph, when to start a new paragraph. If something was in quotes, they would put, say, parentheses or quotation marks. If I made a mistake, they would actually say, strike that, and they would give me the, the correct wording. So all I had to do was sit back and listen. And being a psychologist, you know, my first thought was, oh my gosh, am I psychotic? What's happened here? But it didn't take long to realize this is great information that's coming in. My very first message was a message about a flower. And they said a flower is a flower. So taking that word mm -hmm. flower and hyphenating it, a flower of energy. And as its roots reach down to Mother Earth and it ascends toward Father Sky, it's in perfect alignment with Source. And then they said, and those were not terms I used back then. And they said that when you're in that perfect alignment, like humans too can be in perfect alignment, then they will open like a flower to potential. And they ended with saying, let us all be flowers of energy. Well, as a psychologist, I stepped back and just observed. My training allowed me to not freak out about the message so I wasn't excited like oh this is so cool I'm channeling nor was I frightened I just stepped back allowed the information to flow like that flower and I would I would dictate what I was receiving later that night when I would come home from work I would transcribe that after a while I had months I had like a hundred pages of typed messages some I, I start um, initially after the flower message, I started getting information from people who had passed mm -hmm. that had information to share with others. So I shared that and they were all like spot on. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what's, you know, what is this? But it's been such a journey. But so I, I get them through dictation. 
when I first started getting messages, Gary, I could not visualize. If someone told me to close my eyes and to think of the Eiffel Tower, I would see blank. I couldn't visualize anything. But that skill has really developed. And now I can be sitting at a, at a table, driving my car, and there's this other part of me that starts to visualize as the message comes in. And then if I'm in a space where I'm not driving, it doesn't matter. I can actually move more of my presence intentionally there. And when I'm in a vision, it's more real than in 3D. I mean, I might be in a field and I can, I can hear a fly that buzzes by. I can feel the grass beneath my feet. I can feel the warmth of the sun on my back. But you're, you're in a, re, a air quote reality that is actually more profound than in 3D because you're not relying on your five physical senses. Our senses limit us. My training as a psychologist said that if you couldn't measure something using your senses, it didn't exist. Right. But I've learned otherwise. So now I can go into a vision as messages come in. And because now I'm using the visual and I'm hearing things, you know, again, not, not using my ears. I have some control. So what I can do like a DVR, I can freeze frame it. I can stop. Mm -hmm. I can pan back and then see more of, of this scene. I can also fast forward or I can take a different step. So what I'm actually doing is um, having an out of body experience. I'm being very lucid, like in a lucid dream. And I am taking control and using that to go wherever I need to go. I mean, I have had experiences where I find myself in the cosmos and a comet comes along, I can actually attach my awareness to that comet as it zooms through space. Wow. Which, you know, wow, is so right. And, <laughs> and, you know, I still go back to, but Candace, you're a psychologist. How, how did you go from point A to, to point Z? But that's the thing about it, Gary. I mean, my first book, uh, the subtitle is An Ordinary Person's extraordinary journey into the unknown if this could happen to me it could happen to anyone this is part of our earth's transition to a to a higher vibrational frequency we are learning to become well i don't know that we're learning um we are becoming more open because as earth transitions that veil that interdimensional veil thins so people like me can just be driving to work one day and all of a sudden start getting messages do you think that part of it like when you first started having it, the reason it happened when you were driving is because your conscious mind is focused on that so because when you're you know, your conscious mind is focused on that then your unconscious mind is more open to other things so it's easier for information to come through rather than when you're not doing anything and your conscious or ego mind is just all over the place. Absolutely. That makes perfect sense because when this occurred, I was driving to work early in the morning. I would get to work like an hour early. There was no traffic on the road. So I didn't have to use a lot of attention on, on my driving. You know, it's not like I had cars all around me. So I was focused enough on my driving, but my car's actually almost on automatic pilot. So I'm focused there, yet the rest of me is, is open. And then that's what allowed this to occur. Now, a few years later, I, I was 
I'm a clinical psychologist. I was working in a school system. A few years later, my uh, job changed. I went to a different school that started like two hours later. And there was no way I would get message when you have all this traffic buzzing by. But when, when you're in a position where you're focused enough on driving or on some task, but you're not overly focused, it allows that rest of you to just be open for information that comes in. So yeah, I mean, that was that was a, a good point to make. Hmm. And then I guess from there, you've learned how to open that channel anytime. One of the things I was reading recently was too, you, you mentioned like you being a channeler. Uh, I was reading this book that says that everything that we experience, like all the ideas that we have are out there in a collective consciousness. And so in reality, all ideas that we have that are new to us are channeled. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally, totally. There's one chapter in my first book, The Reluctant Messenger, that talks about that. I don't even remember the name of the chapter, but the messengers told me that the brain does not think, that the brain only receives information. And as that information comes in, it's new to us. So we, quote, think that we think it, that we thought that, but we don't. We're actually opening ourselves to receive that information. Everything is energy, Gary, and energy is non-physical, and it's all around us. And when we can learn to fine tune our senses and then to actually expand our senses beyond the 5D, beyond the 3D into the 5D, then we can start using our brain a little differently. And we realize as information comes in, it's like, oh, where did that come from? The messengers told me there were like different um channels maybe or uh, or stations so you know one you might get a thought and it's like okay you think you think that then every once in a while you'll get a thought that just pops into your mind and i'm sure you've been like me you'll say where did that come from it's like well well that's because you're opening more and you're allowing more information to come in but our brains are wonderful they help us develop language. They help us navigate the 3D, but there's so much more than what we think because that's what connects us to that vast consciousness mm -hmm. where everything resides. And we're just picking up information, just like a radio station, like a radio tuner. Mm. Are there things here that block us from having those type of experience and i'll give you an example this is my own personal example um for a while i was taking a medication for epilepsy and it really seemed to mess up everything i was doing you know anything i think maybe i was receiving for some reason it was distorting it you know and now that i've switched to a different medication everything seems to be clearer so are some of the things that we do here in our, or things that we put in our bodies affect how we receive information? Yes, yes. I mean, I remember that saying years ago, you are what you eat, you know, and you, you see these people that eat these pristine diets and they seem to channel better. They seem to get information better. Um, but then you look at someone like me, and in your case, especially when you're on a medication, that has a stronger effect. But I don't eat just plant-based. Mm -hmm. You know, I love a burger now and then, especially if someone else cooks it for me, like my daughter. You know, I, you know, my diet. Oh my gosh, I ate so much Halloween candy. <laughs> You know? Me too. <laughs> so I, I do not have the best diet by any means, yet I'm still able to open and receive. But, and, and I, again, I think that's because of that transition that earth is going through. Mm -hmm. But if you are more mindful about what you eat, if you do eat organic, if you do eat more plant-based, you know, 
I'm sure that would really help people be more receptive to those subtle frequencies where we see guidance. But then you can take someone like me who doesn't, and I'm, I'm still there. I'm still very open. Yeah, I'm off. I live off a strict regimen of ramen noodles. Oh, my favorite! My favorite. <laughs> I love ramen. <laughs> So what is the new book that it will be about? When is it coming out? Oh, actually, the new book is already out. Okay. I, I started, um, well, I, I have two. I have The Reluctant Messenger and then The Reluctant Messenger Returns. In that first book, The Reluctant Messenger, every chapter was so different. You know, mm -hmm. Some about angels, some about cosmic beings, some about you know, crystalline grid that what I did is I took four of those chapters and I reworked them and I made them into smaller books. Right now they're just eBooks, but next mm -hmm. year in, in 2023, I'm going to have them, you know, in, in paperback and hardback. But um, this is a series called From the Reluctant Messenger. Now, book number five is very different. I went to Monroe Institute and I, you know, you've heard me talk about Monroe before. Mm -hmm. This is this is a place outside Charlottesville, Virginia. And it's a wonderful place to learn how to have an out-of-body experience. And I was at this program called NDE, so near death experience, NDE Spectrum. Now for those who don't know about Monroe, they use sound-based technology. So all you have to do as a participant is to, you know, put on your headphones and the frequencies. They use binaural beats. They use something that's called Monroe Sound Science. It's mm. binaural beats and, and other sound technology. But I call it the lazy person's way to meditate. You just lay down, close your eyes, turn off the lights, put those headphones on, and the frequencies take you where you need to go. Well, the first full day of the program, we had something that was called a free flow exercise. So there's no verbal guidance. You're just relaxing. And immediately I started getting messages. Well, that's not unusual. I, that's what I do. And it was beautiful and it was poetic, which is not uncommon. They were talking about, you know, energy and it's the breath of the flower as she whispers in the wind. Stuff that's like, I wish I could have made that up, but. It's the current of an eagle as she glides through the sky. And then all of a sudden, Gary, it's like, boom, everything changed. Now, I'm in my room. The lights are off. Everything is dark. And I felt this energy that was so different. It's like, okay, no big deal. A new messenger's coming in. And the message was something like, um, all sensors are open and ready to receive data from other sources. Well, it's like really different from an eagle gliding through the sky. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I started having this vision and I saw myself slipping inside a, the only thing I can describe it as is like a small flying machine. Now, when this happens, there's, I'm like bilocating in the 5D, so there's me who's observing and who's recording what's going on. And then there's the me who's actually in that experience. And the reason I record when this happens, I don't have to remember. I mean, it's like I can check it out later. But I got into this aircraft and it was like putting on a, a leather glove. It just fit to me perfectly. And then like I saw these like electrical things just buzzing around and this this machine just melded to my body and then there was this message and part of the message was we are from a galactic council of light and I'm thinking okay this is weird then I had these this energy that just rushed through my body one started at my shoulders, rushed down my arms and out my hands. My hands are by my side. I'm lying on my back. 
The other started at my hip and just rushed down my legs and out my feet. Now, I didn't realize till later, once I got home and I was transcribing this, it's like, okay, I had just become a, a ship. You know, I slipped into this personal aircraft and now I just blasted off like a rocket. And I found myself in this void where I am just spinning and spinning. And then at the top of the void, it clears and I look. On both sides of me, I see two beings on each side. I see four beings. Now, as a psychologist, it's like, okay, describe what's going on. So I started scanning them. And it's like, okay, almond-shaped eyes, greenish skin, long, long necks, long fingers, arms, no discernible nails on the tips of their fingers, rounded tips, um, no mouth and like gill-like features on the side of their their heads and i'm thinking what on earth is going on here this was just so new so different for me but i didn't react gary i just observed and i documented then i looked at them and they start waving back and forth like in slow motion they're still looking at me mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, wow, that is so weird. And then I took my hands that were by my side. I put them above my head. And then I, I realized I'm doing the same thing. I'm like waving back and forth. Now, once again, once I got home, I had this aha moment. And I realized I was like wiggling out of that machine that I was in, mm -hmm. like a cocoon, I was wiggling out. And then the communication became clearer. They had obviously told me to do that, or at least demonstrated it. But now I could really communicate with them. And it was all telepathic. Um, they told me that I could refer to them as the Galactic Eight. And I'm thinking, wait, one, two, three, four. <laughs> there's only four of them. And they said, there's two at your feet and there's two at your head. I looked up, I, I looked to my left and I saw this group of them. And then I realized, I didn't realize, I mean, until I did my um, transcription, Oh, that was that Galactic Council of Eight, that Galactic Council, and they were just observing. Mm -hmm. Now, what really is so interesting for me is, Gary, this did not freak me out. They were respectful. They were asking every step of the way, is this okay? And I was giving permission, which actually shocks me. I saw them. I'll look up and I looked up to see what they were looking at. And there was this green dot floating in the air. Now, Gary, I am in my bed. Everything's dark at Monroe. I see this with my physical eyes. I open my eyes and I see this green dot. And that dot comes and lands right here on my neck at the, the jugular notch. And that's when I realized it's a laser and it goes down the center of my chest all the way down to my pubic bone. And it like splits me open. It's not painful. And once again, I'm okay with this. I even say, while you're in there, would you please take care of anything that needs to be taken care of? They kept telling me to breathe deeply i know part of that was to relax me but then they said that they were gleaning biologic data from my exhalations that's how they were getting information from me so every time i would stop breathing deeply they would have me 
do that again. Then there was another laser that came and it went right across my shoulders. So all the way across my chest into my shoulders, back and forth. And where it met that other um, laser, right. it created this green uh, pulsating blob. <laughs> I don't know what right. else to call it. But it was like I had a green heart. Well, I know about the chakras. I didn't right. used to. But that's the color of the heart chakra is green. And then the, they told me that this was a homing beacon. And if I wanted to reconnect with them or they wanted to reconnect with me, they could do that through this homing beacon. Now, you know, there was, there was more to it, but this is pretty much the, the gist of it. Um, they started fading in the background. The, um, the, the whole thing took about 45 minutes. I think that's how long the, the meditation was, but they faded and then within a minute, the meditation ended. And then it's like, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, I have never been interested in ETs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wrote this short book. It's an ebook. It's only like three bucks. It's, but, but I hesitated. What do I do with this information? And it's just like my first book. I am reluctant. I am hesitant. But I felt like if I didn't share this, I wasn't being truthful. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking, is this part of my group of messengers? I mean, I had a whole chapter on called Cosmic Contact where star beings connected with me, but I never saw them. And, and once I got home, I, I asked the messengers and they said, yes, they're, they're part of my group, just like angels are part of my group. And that I was ready for this type of contact and this type of interaction, but I wasn't ready before. Now, one other thing happened, well, a couple other things happened, but a couple days, and I'm still at Monroe, because this is a week-long program, and this is the first program, uh, first full day of the program, I woke up one morning at a little before four, and the beds you sleep in are single size, you know, they're, they're small, and I had rolled over on the headphones, there's a little shelf to keep your headphones on, because this is where we do all of our meditation. And it, it hurt. I mean, it was right above my left hip and right below my left rib cage. It's like, oh my gosh, what is it? So I got up to grab the headphones to put them back on the shelf. I mean, because I knew I was on something hard. Gary, with my eyes open, I was not on the headphones. I saw three long green fingers withdrawing from my body. That's what I was lying on. And I let that sink in. It physically woke me from a deep sleep. It was once again, something physical that happened. And I immediately knew that this was the Galactic Eight or one of them. And they were returning me to the safety of my bed. Mm -hmm. I knew that I had been with them in their ship or whatever it's called. They did whatever. I don't have any memory of it. And I might. I haven't yet discovered that. And they were returning me. When I got home, I had an, um, just another dream, I'll, I'll, a, a dream that I'll share with you real quickly. The Galactic Eight came to me in a dream, very lucid. They were just right in front of me. They turned around. And when they turned around, they unzipped, where I could see the back of them, they unzipped the back of their heads all the way down to their shoulder blades. And that skin fell away. And I saw just these skeletal structures. And then another aha moment. It's like, Oh, 
No wonder their almond-shaped eyes had no pupils. Those weren't eyes. That skin, the green, everything that I saw, those were like spaceships, I mean, space suits. That's what they needed in order to be in that space where we met. Mm -hmm. It's just like our space suits. Now, I know that, you know, when, when you start off your episode, you one thing you talk about with, with Jared Murphy is, are they aliens or are they us? One thing that came to me when I first met the, these, the Galactic Eight is these were very wise beings. I knew they were very knowledgeable, but I couldn't help but keep wondering, are they us in the future? I don't know that answer, but that is certainly a possibility and maybe a probability. Because when you're in those other dimensional spaces, there is no time. And the more I think about this NDE spectrum, that was the name of the program, we were in those areas, those non-physical mm -hmm. realms where, the, where you go when you have a near-death experience. Time doesn't exist there. So it very well, Carrie, it could have been you. You and me both do, but it's just, it's fascinating. But that's my, that's my newest adventure, mm. which just really shocked me because I've never been interested in this sort of thing. In fact, I've been a little hesitant, but I've it happened. Come across quite a few people that have been in touch with the Galactic Council. Really? Um, yeah, you're definitely not the first person I've spoken with. Uh, one was um, Sunbow True Brother. Um, you know, I, I've talked a little bit about it with Preston Dennett, where he's recorded a lot of these events, and um, Kathleen Martin, too. So it's definitely not a unique thing. You know, one of the things that you mentioned, too, is, you know, like, it's like there's a them and a us. But is there really a them and a us? Or is this all some type of manifestation of this greater I am being, and we're not yeah. really separate. We're all part of the same entity experiencing different parts of itself. And that makes such perfect sense because so many of the messages I get are about unity and we are all one. And when we step outside of our physical bodies, we become part of cosmic consciousness it's just like an ice cube and you drop that in the middle of the ocean that ice cube might feel like it's separate but it isn't it's part of all that is it's just for that moment an individual expression of the whole and isn't that i mean that's what we all are we are not separate entities. We feel that we are. Yes. We have incarnated into earth and we are in these physical bodies that limit us until we go to sleep at night and our true essence, our spirit, our soul, whatever can float among truth and go and be and do whatever we want because we're in the non-physical. But the non-physical, the spirit, the soul, that's the true us and it's part of everything you can't separate it. it's it it is it just is yeah it, as in, like i mentioned earlier you know once we put that ego aside um when, or when it's distracted by something like driving or whatever it's easier for us to perceive that connected connectedness What benefit does this have for us? Why are, are human beings going through this transition? And how do you think it's going to benefit know, the cosmic consciousness? Well, when, when Gaia, the spirit of Mother Earth, started her transition, 
she had a choice. She, she was transitioning. She could bring us humanity along with her, or she could leave us behind. She chose to bring us along with her. So as those inter interdimensional veils thin, we are now gaining access to the non-physical realm. Now, many of us are going there kicking and screaming. We don't want to do that. We want to stay where we're comfortable, where we think that our physical body, the me, 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 is all that there is. It, you know, it's not, I was going to say it's not always, but it's probably never comfortable to step outside what you know and mm -hmm. what's familiar. Of course. But once we start to do that, just like when you asked me about Hurricane Ian, I mean, you know, I we went without electricity, we had to rearrange our whole lives, but we learned to get into a flow that was different than anything we've had before. And that that helped us survive, especially those five days without electricity. But once we let go of our ego, that's just clawing on and wanting to, to hang on to what we know, then we can step into something that's new. I mean, you know, that sometimes you'll have a dream that when you wake up, it is so beautiful. You want to go right back to sleep and experience it. Why? Because your true essence, your spirit, your soul was, you know, with someone or in a situation where you're flying throughout the cosmos, you know, you're, you're part of the greater picture. And you also realize you have a very important role in the in cosmic consciousness we are not these tiny little people that are meaningless we think of a grandfather's clock and then a billion times larger if one cog is broken if one piece one bolt falls out that clockwork will not work we are all part of cosmic consciousness. And as much as we think we're not significant, we are, and we have choices and we can choose. And a lot of this started, or my awareness of it started with the pandemic, when we found ourselves across the globe realizing okay life is changing people can't just get up and go to work like they used to you know on, on a global level we had to readjust same thing what but on a, a smaller level with me and hurricane ian i had to change but all of this is giving us opportunities to change opportunities to learn I mean, just through the hurricane, I'm learning about resilience. I'm learning about gratitude. I'm, I'm learning so many lessons that I would not have had if I had not gone through this. It's an opportunity for us to awaken, to realize that we're more than our physical bodies. Our physical bodies limit us. We can step outside of that. And as we step outside of it, we end up with a grander perspective. I can remember astronauts going to the moon and talking about the first time that they saw Earth from a distance. And then they realized we are all one. This is one planet. This is humanity. Mm -hmm. It's not that little mind, that little brain, that little ego of us versus them we are all one and we have some opportunities hopefully that we'll learn we will learn and we will grow from that and all of that helps earth as she's transitioning to these higher frequencies what do you think will happen to people who just refuse to um, make that transition 
the you know people that are just going to be stubborn and be resistant will they be forced to transition anyway or will they be giving a choice to continue on as they are that is such a good question and i i have no idea but i do know that when we reach a tipping point not everyone has to come along but when we reach a tipping point we will all be in a better place now many years ago people thought that meant okay earth's going to really change and then these catastrophic things and you know wasn't there a left behind series or something like mm. that you know that we're all going to ascend and these other people aren't and I don't think it's that at all. Right. I think that it is all just being able to step into a heart-based, much more loving environment. And when there is this tipping point, that will become so much stronger that hopefully people will gravitate toward it and want want to join want to have what she has you know right plus well, how can anybody really get left behind if we're all part of the same thing anyway right right you know? right it's just an illusion it's not real you're right you're absolutely right it is an illusion mm. cool so um when do you expect to be able to go home uh well soon um but i've been saying that for 35 <laughs> days now soon um my daughter's protective uh she wants to make sure that you know i'm safe when when i we did walk around the building and there were uh, there were there were some of the the floors had collapsed mm -hmm. but then it's like okay that's the way that concrete floor was made it, it's it's not that the structural integrity of the building is at risk some floors and walls were made to break away um but when you look at it and all of a sudden there's no floor anymore it's it's kind of scary but i am hoping i'm hoping soon mm. when you were without the electricity and all the amenities that we're used to what was it how did it feel going back to primitive life? Did that feel more natural to you than having air condition and electric light? Very good question. Um, let me tell you two things. First of all, when that first happens, it's like, okay, you don't say, oh, right, this is right. This we're in with nature and we're going to just go with the flow. No, you just do what you normally do. Uh, but you can't do it because when you have no electricity, you can't see. Let me give you one example. Uh, it just, you know, the sun had just set. And I'm in Florida, so it's flat. When the sun sets, it's dark. And I went into the, a bathroom to get a glass of water that I had. And, and when I talk about a glass, it's actually a glass glass of water. Mm -hmm because there was no electricity we had opened the windows and so the interior doors would would blow so it would slam shut so i had propped open one of my granddaughter's doors with a little toy and i get to the bathroom and then i realize i can't see now there's so many things you know you have you have your 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 i didn't have my phone with me but you have a clock or or you have a there's just little lights that are on if you have electricity and when it's dark it's dark and i'm feeling around for my glass and i'm thinking wow this is what must it it must be like if you're totally blind and i feel it and i get it and then i'm trying to walk out and feel the door and gary i trip and i fall so hard that i i hit the wall I ended up with two goose eggs on my head. The whole left side of my body was sore. I cut a gash in my uh, shin, which is still, I won't show it to you, but it's, it's still five weeks later, it still doesn't look really good. But that glass, 
I was still holding it. And this is where I think my angels were looking out over me. How on earth I hit a door frame and then the door on the outside did so much damage to my body and that glass did not shatter. I cannot imagine what could have happened when I fell on that glass. I cannot even imagine. So that's the first part of when you lose electricity. You think you can do things like you used to. You mm -hmm. can't. Okay. Luckily, I did not have to go to the ER. I bandaged things up and lived with bruises for a while, but it was a lesson. Pay attention. Then once I gave up fighting, it's like, okay, go with the flow. If the, if the sun set at 7.30, I was in bed at 7.32. We just slipped once we gave up and surrendered. It was, when you surrender, it's like you're a leaf on that river. Mm -hmm. You just let it carry you where you need to go. And that's what I did. I just slipped into that natural flow. And going to sleep at night, it's hot as can be. Of course, we don't even have fans. But a breeze would come in the window. You would hear the birds. And it, it just, it was good. I woke up later than usual because this, you know, I didn't have to use an alarm, didn't want to use an alarm. There's no light until the sun comes up. But it just felt so good to give up, relinquish your ego, and slip into that state of this is what we do now. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a whole lot to be said for just letting go and going with things rather than going against them. Yeah. I mean, we, we think we are in control and that's our ego. Um, but it's like, why? What, what are you fighting against? You have a natural alarm clock. It's the sun. She tells you when to go to sleep and when to wake up. It doesn't matter what time it is. You, you go with that natural rhythm. And, you know, once I surrendered, surrendered to that, it was, it was actually kind of nice. Mm. It really was. Cool. Um, so I want to, we're getting, I'm running out of time. And okay. before we wrap this up, uh, where's the best place for my listeners to find you and find your books? Probably just at my website, which is Candice with an I, C A N D I C E, CandiceSanderson.com. You know, my, my books are on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I've got several social media, you know, they can, they can find all that at, on my website, my, you know, my podcast. And if they need to find me, they can. <laughs> all right. So I'll put a link to that in the note to this episode. It okay. was a pleasure having you back. Thank you for taking the time to come back on and talk with me. Oh, Gary, I love talking with you. You're just so much fun to talk to. So thanks for having me back on. So just hang on for one moment and I'm just going to okay. play the outro. Thank you for listening to Everything Imaginable. You can reach Gary at everythingimaginable2020.com or message him at everythingimaginable2020 at gmail.com. He's also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can buy t-shirts, coffee mugs, and other merchandise to support the cost of producing this podcast. Click on the merchandise link at the top of this page, www.everythingimaginable2020.com. You can also buy the book, Enlightenment Guaranteed. It's the only book on Zen that you'll ever need. You can find it on Amazon and it will change your life. Because remember, everything that it says was first imagined. If you loved what you listened to today, don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and share. Again, thank you for listening.
listen to everything imaginable with Gary Cochulli.